Good evening, Madam President. Good evening. Uh, Madam President, I rise in opposition to the legislation before us. I rise today once again deeply concerned about the action we are about to undertake in this chamber. Every day I hear from the businesses in my district, both large and small, about how damaging this minimum wage legislation will be to their prospects for the future of their businesses in Connecticut. The proponents of this bill have argued that Connecticut must provide a better minimum wage for all workers, regardless of the cost. I disagree. The proponents of this bill have argued that our businesses in Connecticut can easily afford the increase in wages, in large part by reducing the profits they may currently enjoy. I disagree. The proponents of this bill have argued that this legislation will increase the number of jobs in Connecticut and the opportunity for more people to work. I disagree. The proponents of this bill have argued that this increased minimum wage will inject more money into our local economy. I also disagree. The reality of this legislation as it is before us is that our employers, both large and small, cannot afford to pay a higher wage. Their cost of doing business in Connecticut is some of the highest in the nation. Their margins are some of the smallest in the nation. They pay some of the highest energy costs and some of the highest overall taxes. We, heard, we have heard some compelling and even heartbreaking stories tonight, and I have another one. Earlier, Senator Sampson spoke about forum plastics in Waterbury. And I would ask you to imagine, for a moment, being the proud owner of that business, a business that employs 153 people in Waterbury, the city in Connecticut with the highest unemployment rate in the state and one of the highest in the country. And your business is manufacturing plastic parts for the medical industry. Imagine being this business owner tonight, right now, watching this debate preparing to tell your 153 employees that tomorrow you will be shutting your business down and putting 153 people out of work in the city with the highest unemployment rate in the state of Connecticut because you simply cannot afford to pay a $15 minimum wage. Imagine being the business owner that will terminate 153 loyal, quality employees because you cannot afford to do business in Connecticut. The owners of this company said today, we want to stay. We don't want to be forced out. But if you do raise the wage to $15 per hour, we will have no choice but to leave. And it's very sad. They went on to say that the minimum wage increase will drive profit margins for their company of roughly 8% to a little over 2% making it nearly impossible to stay in business and remain competitive with other companies. They went on to say, many of our law lawmakers don't realize that Forum Plastics competes globally. We're competing against companies in China and Mexico, and those companies have competitive wages. It's a challenge. And lastly, they said, most compelling and heartbreaking, most of us have been in Connecticut our entire lives and we'd like to work here for the remainder of our careers. And they questioned, is it too late for us to do anything about this? First and foremost, we must understand that minimum, wa minimum wage jobs exist for the same reason that a supervisor's job exists, or a manager's job exists, or a vice president's job exists. Different levels of skill, different levels of responsibility, Different levels of management are all factors, among many others, that determine the difference in a wage that someone earns. The reality is, as has already been spoken to tonight, that some, demands, some jobs demand a higher wage because of the responsibilities, the skills, the number of people being managed, among others. And some jobs demand a lower wage for the same reasons. And the reality is that an employer, whether a nonprofit or for-profit, whether publicly owned or privately owned, determines all of the factors of their finances when they price the services they provide or the product they produce, including the cost of labor, which includes the hourly wage. 
You know, I'm not an economist, but it's not difficult to, at all to understand that some jobs simply do not warrant a higher wage, and that being forced to pay a higher wage positions the employ employer poorly as it tries to compete in the Connecticut marketplace and economy. These employers simply cannot afford the cost of a higher minimum wage. Some argue that our businesses in Connecticut are rolling in profits and they have an obligation to share those pro profits with their employees by supporting an increase in minimum wage. You know, I disagree with that as well. We live in the greatest country in the world, the best example of capitalism and a free market anywhere. The decision to share profits, the decisions as to the wages that are paid in a capitalistic free market economy are made by the leaders of these businesses with limited government interference by definition. Our wonderful businesses in Connecticut, some local to my neck of the woods as we like to say, businesses like Fascia's Chocolates, Quasi Amusement Park, and Connecticut Basement Systems, just three examples have all explained to me the impact an increase in minimum wage will have on them as employers. This includes increased prices for their products, increased workers' compensation insurance cost, increased unemployment taxes, increased payroll tax expense. When these businesses create their revenue through the sale of their products and services, they only have a few options to cover these increased costs. And I think I understand this. The options are pretty simple. They either increase the cost of their product or they decrease the expense of doing business. So let's talk about the prospect of increasing the cost of a product in Connecticut. We're already threatening this session to add tolls to our highways, which will increase the cost of everything, as essentially everything we create and consume in Connecticut travels on a highway to get where it's going that will likely have a toll booth on it. Our businesses will need to increase the cost of their products to address the cost of tolls. We're all th already threatening this session to add an expanded FMLA coverage, which will also add to the cost of business, requiring our businesses to increase, again, the cost of their products and services. But alas, this bill is about increasing the minimum wage, not tolls, not FMLA. So let's talk real numbers about the impact of an increase in minimum wage on an, on an iconic Connecticut employer, Quasi Amusement Park in Middlebury, Quasi is in its 111th year of operation, continuous in Connecticut, with three generations of the same family running the business. George Francis, co-owner of Quasi, testified before the Labor Committee on March 7th and stated that an increase of 25 cents increases his seasonal payroll by $26,000. So let's do some simple math. Under the provisions of this bill next May 2020, when Quasi opens for the season, George Francis and his partners will have an increase in their seasonal payroll of $104,000. Now, I have no idea what it costs Mr. Francis to run his amusement park, to keep all the rides operating safely, to keep all those brightly colored lights shining that thrill children and, and adults alike as they walk through the park, and how to keep all of the various concessions stocked and ready to serve. But I also have no idea, after a lot of conversations with Mr. Francis, about how he will automatically cover a $104,000 increase in his payroll. I can only assume, as the reasonable pers any reasonable person would, that Quasi generates its revenue from admission fees and the concessions it sells, and that the cost of a day at Quasipog will go up, along with the cost of a hot dog, fries, cotton candy, and a cold beverage. All because we say so tonight via the legislative process. That is not capitalism, and that is not the free market. You know, maybe Quasi can absorb all of that $104,000 and just reduce the amount of profits they earn. As I see it, it's a tough balance between keeping the price of admission to something reasonable that most people can afford versus raising the price and making the park unaffordable for some. And I assure you that that's not something, knowing Mr. Francis, that he would prefer to do. I can only guess that Mr. Francis may have to consider eliminating some jobs. And mind you, Kwasi is a first employer for many local young people in the region. What a terrible conundrum we create 
for a 111-year-old company, three-generation business that is one of the largest employers and taxpayers in the town of Middlebury. Another employer, Bob Lebon Jr., co-owner of Lebon's Markets, a chain of supermarkets in Connecticut, has expressed similar concerns. While Kwasi is a choice of entertainment and some consider a luxury item, the products that Lebon sells, groceries, food, the basic necessities of everyday life, are not luxuries. Mr. Lebon is also a large first-time employer of young people and very proudly states that he's a training ground for entry-level youths, teaching them responsibility, job skills, and behaviors. Mr. Lebon has indicated that in order to address an increase in minimum wage, the cost of products he sells will need to go up, again, creating the conundrum now of not whether or not you can go on a roller coaster ride and eat cotton candy, but creating the conundrum of a consumer needing to make a choice between something they truly need versus something they can actually afford. Another area that will suffer are the donations that Lebon's Markets makes to local charities, like food banks. They're a supermarket chain, after all, and those food banks critically rely upon the support of Lebon's. Both leaders of Kwasi and Lebon's have also spoken to automation within their business. Every one of us in this room has seen this play out in large chain stores like Walmart, Stop and Shop, and McDonald's, where self-service kiosks, self-checkout registers, and other machines have replaced people in these stores. Businesses like Kwasi and Lebon's are no different being forced to explore and evaluate automation and machines over people. And I wonder how many people earning minimum wage today with hopes of increases under the provisions of this bill would support these increases if they knew their jobs were going to be eliminated and replaced by a machine. So much for $15 an hour. During, the Starbucks, during a visit to Starbucks this morning, prior to my arrival here, I had three different employees. I'm, I freely admit, I like Starbucks. I, I drink it every day. Okay? So I see these people every day when I go in and get my iced coffee. Three different employees pulled me aside. They came around the counter. Senator Berthel, I need to speak to you about something. And they didn't want anyone else to hear it. And they said, please, do not support $15 minimum wage. And I looked at them and I said, really? I said, how much do you make? Can you tell me? Do you care? I won't, I won't identify you personally. I won't say, hey, you, you know, and name you. I make 10 20 an hour. I make 10 cents over minimum wage. Each one of these three employees understood beyond any reasonable doubt by looking what has happened to Starbucks stores in other states in the country where the minimum wage has already gone up. They know beyond any reasonable doubt that they can be replaced by a machine. There are Starbucks machines that exist where you and I can go up and place our own order and the machine will drop the cup and, and fulfill the order the same way that the person does behind the counter. The only thing it doesn't do is hand it to you and doesn't say thank you and have a nice day. And they're very concerned. The reality is that increasing the minimum wage would force businesses to lay off employees and raise unemployment levels. The Congressional Budget Office projected that a minimum wage increase a few years ago from 725 to 1010 would result in the loss of 500,000 jobs. In a recent survey of 1,200 businesses and human resource professionals, 38% of employers who currently pay minimum wage said they would lay off some employees if the minimum wage was raised to 1010. 54% said they would decrease hiring levels. San Francisco's Office of Economic Analysis said that an increase to $15 would reduce the city's employment by about 15,270 private sector jobs. The reality is that a minimum wage increase would hurt businesses and force companies to close. 60% of small business owners say that raising the minimum wage will hurt most small business owners, according to a 2013 Gallup poll. An executive at the fast food chain White Castle said the company would be forced to close almost half of its stores nationwide and let go thousands of workers if the federal minimum wage were raised to $15.
Forbes reported that an increase in the minimum wage has led to the closure of several Walmart stores and the cancellation of promised stores yet to open. The argument is also frequently made that an increased minimum wage increases the amount of dollars spent in the community. That seems logical. Higher wages, more money to spend. But when balanced against the reality of the impact increased minimum wage will have on jobs and the cost of products and services, the argument is illogical, especially here in Connecticut. And again, as I spoke to a moment ago, add to this consideration for what else is coming at us before the end of the session with tolls and FMLA. And the minimum wage earner may find themselves in an even more difficult condition with regard to affording the cost of living in Connecticut. I am deeply concerned. I fear for the future of our great state. I hear every day from people and businesses regarding how Hartford continues to raise taxes to take more money out of our pockets to make living in Connecticut even less affordable. I hear from constituents every week who say to me, I'm saying goodbye to Connecticut and our insatiable appetite for government spending. I hear from seniors who cannot make ends meet and have to make decisions between groceries and heat because of the cost of living in Connecticut. Small businesses cannot afford the provisions of this legislation. Small businesses make up more than 75% of the economic engine in Connecticut. And if we continue to toxify the environment in which these businesses must produce, sell, and provide their services, their threats to leave for friendlier ground will no longer be threats, but a reality. We heard and received hours and pages of testimony against a $15 minimum wage. We again find ourselves on the edge of a dangerous decision, one which I cannot and will not support. This legislation only adds to the economic crisis and disaster that is upon us in Connecticut. We should be focused as a legislative body on making our business climate more friendly in Connecticut. We should be focused on making living in Connecticut more affordable. We should be focused on reducing government spending in Connecticut, thereby reducing the taxes we collect and the biannual onslaught of new ways to tax and generate revenue. Once we have addressed those issues, once we are providing the best opportunity for people and businesses to be successful, only then should we consider the type of legislation that is before us right now. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Berthel.